I think I was as sick as, <laughs> as they made me out to be. As a matter of fact, I wasn't sick at all. As I told some of your colleagues yesterday, all I had to do was get over the incision. <laughs> <laughs> Are you working with the Nautilus machines uh, still? Yeah. 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 yeah, Back to the same routine, even the same weights <laughs> that I was doing before. Good. I reduced those to start with. I didn't want to burst any stitches, <laughs> but uh, now it's all back to normal. Perfect. Well, since we have so little time, perhaps we should we should go ahead and start, if you don't mind, sir. Fine. We'll, we'll, we'll fire away. Um, Mr. President, uh, you've been briefed by uh, Secretary Schultz on his trip to Moscow. Are you uh, disturbed by the uh, way the summit is shaping up as a result of that briefing? No, not at all, because obviously that trip wasn't to do any negotiating. It was to explore uh, well, to give to them what the ideas were that we thought should be discussed that were interest, of interest to us in the summit and to find out from them what it was they wanted to discuss. And uh, uh, to that end, uh, I think the, the meeting served a useful purpose. The, uh, I, don't, I think also, though, that uh, what George was trying to do was to, uh, there's been too much of a tendency to try to build a euphoria in advance. And uh, none of us are euphoric about this. We realize that we've got uh, very real differences that have to be discussed. And uh, uh, so he was not, he was trying to portray that meeting as not anything that should hold out these euphoric hopes. Well, the reports indicated that uh, Mr. Gorbachev felt that uh, one of the dominant influences on American foreign policy and its formulation were the military-industrial complex and uh, anti-Soviet extremists. Uh, how would you try and convince uh, Mr. Gorbachev that his advisors are mistaken? I think that would be very easy uh, to do because the way he presented this, uh, that this could have such an influence, you only have to look at what is the percentage of money being spent on these weapon systems what percentage is that of gross national product? And you see that that's a very minor element in our whole economy. It could not possibly influence national policy. And once he understands that, and I think this is the way to, to point it out to him, and I think, he would, I think he'd understand that then. One of the other things that uh, seemed to be unclear on his part was his uh, limited understanding of the reason behind which uh, the United States How would you somehow rather get him to understand the reasoning behind which you advance that policy to a national goal? Well, the whole thing started right in our cabinet room, and I started it quite some time ago. And that was when we were meeting with the chiefs of joint chiefs, of, or the, the joint chiefs of staff. I um, I brought up the question that all these years of the nuclear development of nuclear weapons, this was the first weapon in the history of man that had not led to the creation of a defensive system against it. And I wanted to know their own thinking about, was it worthwhile looking into this? Is it possible to come up with a defense? And they were all agreed it was. And right there was given birth to the program to go forward and see if such a system can be perfected. Now, I think when he understands that what I've been talking about here is that uh, we're going to go forward with that. We're not going to halt research into something that could be so important to all mankind uh, just on the hope that they might uh, agree to a certain number of uh, weapons done away with uh, on both sides in our nuclear arsenals, but that if and when the research would reveal that such a weapon is practical, that could intercept missiles on their way to the target, then I believe that, should, that system should be used to bring an end to the threat of nuclear war. 
And I really mean it when I say that I would like to propose then that with all the powers that have nuclear weapons, we sit down and work out an arrangement, if possible, where they will all agree to eliminate the weapons in return for which we would make this defensive system uh, available to all the world. And uh, if they wouldn't do that, uh, that did not mean that we would forego deploying that weapon or that system. And uh, so there was a mistake in interpretation several days ago about whether I was giving them. I think I resolved that with two words the other day. <laughs> you mentioned uh, research. Uh, what about testing and uh, development as a different, uh, different category for SDI? Uh, activities as distinct from research. Uh, are you committed to going ahead with testing and development as well, or is this something you would be prepared to negotiate? We believe that all of that uh, comes within the ABM Treaty. Uh, there have been protests from the Soviet Union that that isn't true. Well, uh, we claim they've made some violations of the treaty, but we're not talking about violating the treaty. We don't think that that point comes up until you get to deployment. And then, before deployment, we would seek this kind of an agreement that I mentioned. So it's everything short of deployment that you feel is permissible under the treaty? Under we, the treaty. we believe that research in this process and all is covered by the, or is uh, well within the bounds of the treaty. One of the other things that uh, was indicated was that uh, Mr. Gorbachev apparently uh, was uh, fairly combative and in a sense ideologically combative at the sessions with uh, uh, the Secretary of State and uh, his uh, party. Um, how would you propose to uh, deal with him in the sense of a negotiating technique under those circumstances? Well, I think that it's understandable. No man would be in the position he's in unless he adhered to uh, Soviet policy and communist philosophy and so forth. But I don't think that that's necessary to try and disabuse him of uh, his beliefs. The, we have to live in the world together. And I think the idea is to point out to them that we're not out to destroy their system or change it, and uh, we're not going to allow them to change ours. But if we recognize that it is an advantage to both of us to have continued peace and uh, go forward with the, the systems under which we presently exist, but to eliminate the distrust between us. Uh, if they are believing, if they believe that we represent a threat to them in some way. I think all the evidence is on our side that we don't. By going back to the years following World War II, when we were the only nation, major nation in the world that had not had its industry pounded to rubble by bombings, our military strength was at its very height. Uh, even though we had grievous losses in the war, we had not been in it that long that we could match uh, the other participants in in that regard. And we had the ultimate weapon, a monopoly on that weapon. And it seems to me that to point out that in all those years, we not only did not take advantage of that strength uh, when we could have dictated to the world, but we at that time, when we had the monopoly, tried to introduce measures that would place nuclear power of that kind in international hands so that there, uh, there wouldn't be any country uh, with a monopoly on it. And uh, the contrast is <coughs> their vast military buildup, which is basically offensive, not a defensive buildup, as ours is, and uh, their aggression their policy that has taken them into Afghanistan and Ethiopia and South Yemen uh, here in our own hemisphere. And that uh, if there's anyone that has a right to believe they're threatened, it is the West to believe it is threatened by the Soviet Union. Does that mean that you think you might be able to persuade uh, Secretary Gorbachev to agree to a set of principles uh, in terms of helping accelerate the, the development of an arms control agreement that might guide the negotiators? Let, let, me, let me put it this way, if I can, that, that the, uh, and I don't mean to talk too much about negotiating tactics in advance, then, then those tactics become useless. But 
if we can convince them, well, I summed it up the other day in a line that I wish I could quote the individual. It was published, and I read this one line, and I think it describes exactly what our purpose should be. And that is that nations do not distrust each other because they are armed. They are armed because they distrust each other. So our negotiation should be aimed at eliminating the distrust. And this would require not just words between us, but deeds, actions that we both could take that would help convince the other that we meant uh, no first strike or no harm. Mr. President, do you believe, as some authorities do, that you are going to Geneva in an unusually strong bargaining position? Well, I think compared to previous uh, years, yes, we do have a strength that, uh, that we haven't had uh, in times before this, uh, both military and economic. And therefore, I, I, we certainly don't go hat in hand. And I believe it will aid us, not in imposing our will on someone, we don't intend to do that, but it will aid us in convincing them that there is an advantage to both of us in arriving at a better understanding than we have now. And by what standards would you feel that you would come away from a successful summit? By what standards should we judge? Well, for one thing, if we had uh, set a plan for continued negotiations. I don't think you solve all the problems at once, that we were going to go on seeing each other and working on our uh, these various problems. Uh, uh, if uh, we could eliminate enough distrust that uh, uh, both sides recognize that the, uh, that the problem of arms control should now be turned over to our negotiators in Geneva uh, to see it because they have said what we've said. Remember, they are, they're on public record of claiming that they would like to see the elimination of nuclear weapons and certainly a reduction that might eventually lead to that. Well, if we both are agreed on that, then we certainly ought to be willing to find a way to, to get at it. Could I extrapolate from that question, Mr. President? Uh, do I understand from what you're saying that you might expect yet from Geneva some kind of formal commitment from you and Mr. Gorbachev that would then be turned over to your negotiators to flesh out? Um, yeah, I can't believe that, that we will um, deal with specifics and numbers. The difference is between us now because it's apparent that we have agreed to some of the terms that they submitted in their proposal. Well, this to me is the first time I, I believe that I've seen that any beginning of real negotiations, having been engaged in negotiations in the labor management field on labor side for about 20 odd years, I've always believed you go in with your proposal, there's a counter proposal, and you keep on going until someplace between those two you arrive at something you think is mutually satisfactory. Well, now this has happened to us here with their return proposal. Ours now reflects some of our thinking in our original proposal, but acceptance of some of their terms. Now, if they're ready to continue with that process, that's where it belongs. And I, I think we'd be somewhat wasting our time if we tried to fight down to the wire on individual weapons or things of that kind in Geneva. I think the base that to me discussed there is much broader than that. It isn't really, uh, just a, a thing of arms control to be settled there. What is to be settled there is the thing that would make arms control a natural follow-up. Could I uh, turn back to SDI for a moment, Mr. President? Many experts seem to believe that if we pursue SDI, the Soviets will massively increase their deployment of ICBM. Now, isn't there a grave risk, therefore, if if increasing their first strike, uh, they're increasing their first strike capability against us faster than you could increase defenses. Except for one thing, while we're going forward with this SDI, they're going to have to understand that there's no way that we will let them achieve a great superiority in arms uh, that puts us at risk. Now, if they're prepared to face that, that uh, 
we're determined that such a, an edge will not be given, then I think they'll see the, the wisdom of uh, discussing what we're going to do. So what you'd like to do is see them hold offensive weapons in place while the exploration continues then as to whether their balance can be achieved. Well, or what has been proposed by both sides. Both of us have expressed the desire to reduce the number of weapons. And I just have to believe that when they understand that we really mean that we're not trying to develop a defensive weapon in order to obtain a first strike advantage. But in other words, we'll sit and talk with them before we uh, take advantage of that weapon if once it is proven practical. Mr. President, I might follow up on that, sir. The Soviets are arguing publicly that as a condition for reducing offensive weapons, the United States must agree to some sort of limitations on testing and development of our defensive weapons. Are you prepared to negotiate a testing uh, and development? Or no, I think that's a part of research. And the other point that hasn't been brought up here, but that we might as well face, the Soviet Union is far ahead of us in this same kind of research. They started it years ago. They've been engaged in it in a whole defensive pattern. And I think maybe one of their concerns is just that uh, they're afraid we might get it before they do. So, so in effect, you're saying that, that research, as you've defined it, is non-negotiable, that, that the offensive question ought to be discussed yeah. separately in the market. We are, we are going to seek to, to find out if there isn't a defensive weapon to match this offensive weapon. Mr. President, could I follow up on that? Is your SDI non-nuclear? I think you've said that in the past. That's right, yes. Uh, but we seem to be continuing underground testing of nuclear versions of SDI. Well, no, you must remember that, that we are still playing catch-up with them on nuclear uh, weapons. They are several systems, new systems ahead of us in their modernization program. And so our testing is routine because down the line we have several uh, projects on the drawing board that if need be, they obviously uh, uh, would probably be eliminated if, uh, if we achieved a, an agreement on reduction of weapons. You don't rule out a testing ban, a ban on testing such as the Soviets have started, Mr. President. It's a possibility, is it? A total ban on nuclear testing. I think their proposal of that uh, was unfair in that, as I say, they are ahead of us and we're playing catch up. And sure, it would be a great advantage if they could say a moratorium on testing and they would then have a built in superiority and we would be prevented from uh, trying to overcome that. Um, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, one of the uh, contentious issues has always been verification of any kind of nuclear arms control agreement. Uh, in the recent interviews which we had in the Soviet Union, they indicated that they were prepared to accept additional technical means and on-site inspections, both from Americans and from international bodies. Do you think this offers hope for a substantive agreement on the issue of verification? We hope so, that recognition of the need for that, because that has been one of the, the failing points in all the previous arms negotiations, this reluctance to allow any real verification. Indeed, uh, we have charged them, and they know with uh, encryption on some of their testing, and that is uh, actually by treaty uh, ruled out that uh, our technical instruments that can track one of their tests and know the power of it and all of that, uh, they have taken actions that are really forbidden by treaty to prevent our from being able to get that information. Mr. President, I want to move on to the question of past Soviet violations. Uh, as you know, the Defense Department is now in the final stages of preparing its report, expected to show that there have been Soviet violations of SALT II. If Mr. Gorbachev does not give you sufficient assurances in Geneva that he will comply with SALT II, will you continue, continue to uh, honor the terms of SALT II after it expires at the end of this year? I thought I made that plain when we said that we would continue the restraint that both had pledged to follow under SALT II, but it would be dependent on uh, the Soviets' practice, their restraint also. Obviously, we're not going to sit here and uh, stand by if uh, we're the only ones that are 
practicing the restraint. So will you be asking in Geneva for, for assurances on that point? I think that that will probably be discussed, yes. All right, so sir, in the past you've uh, also described the, uh, as you know, the Soviet Union as an evil empire that reserves the right to lie, cheat, steal. After all your preparations for Geneva, uh, do you still hold that view? Well, it really wasn't my view that happened in the first press conference I ever held as president. And I was asked a question about whether we could believe them. And what I cited and quoted were statements by their own leaders over the years that summed up in one sentence are that there is no immorality in anything that furthers the progress of the world's socialist revolution. So uh, we, were the, we seem to be the only ones that in our philosophy are bound by morality. But you haven't changed your views of the Soviet Union as a result of all the preparations you've been doing here in the last few weeks. Uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, as we've just been discussing about verification, that uh, they are now going to uh, agree to something in which uh, we won't have to just take each other on good faith. We'll be able to prove what's going on. Uh, Mr. President, would you like to have annual summits with the Soviet leadership. And is that something that you'll be asking for in Geneva? Both of us, both sides, have talked about uh, the possibility of additional meetings and so forth. And uh, uh, I don't know whether we would set this to a final schedule and so forth, but I would, I would like to see us, because as I say, I don't think everything's going to be settled all at once. I would. Uh, uh, I would be willing and will probably propose that they don't, that uh, we again have, we have uh, future meetings and an exchange of them in our own countries instead of going to a neutral uh, country. On an annual basis? What? On an annual basis? I would, I hadn't thought particularly about setting the actual time, but it, I think it would automatically follow that yes, we'd be talking next year and the year after. If, if we could uh, change the venue for a minute from right. in Geneva back home here to Washington and some of the domestic problems, uh, your uh, proposal for tax reform seems to be flying apart in the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, can you sketch out your strategy for, for rescuing? <laughs> well, we're trying, and, uh, and I know that uh, Chairman Rostenkowski is also. But it is true that there are many uh, special uh, interests that are uh, trying to promote changes here and there, which I think would water down the, the whole idea of fairness and simplicity uh, in that. Uh, we, of course, have registered our disagreement with a number of those things. And I think that there's also some of that is bring, being brought about by uh, members of the Congress who don't want tax reform, who like the system the way it is. Well, in the past, you, you have made it uh, pretty clear that some elements of this package are, are in your mind, non-negotiable. I could bring up state and local taxes, for instance, or maybe the, the top personal rate of 35 percent. If Congress sends you uh, legislation that is significantly different than what you sent to them, uh, will you accept it? Will you veto it? Will you, what are your plans? Well, I can't make that decision until I see what they come down with. What the tax reform must be is, first of all, revenue neutral. It must not be a concealed tax increase, which most people in this country have cynically and with justification come to expect that in the past when they've heard somebody talk tax reform, it usually winds up as a tax increase. Um, that it must be fair and it must be simple. But one of the main things I think, I think the American people are more fed up with the present tax system because of its complexity than they are with because of the amount of tax. Let me, let me just follow up just one more thing. You, you mentioned watering down. Could you be specific on which elements of the package are watered down by the Ways and Means Committee? Well, I don't know because it's still going on up there. And uh, I've, I haven't wanted to make uh, Chairman Rostenkowski's uh, task any more difficult. But I think what it deals with is constant uh, coming back in with uh, putting back loopholes that we uh, think should be eliminated. And I think part of this is you can look at any of those loopholes. They were put in for a legitimate reason, but they were put in when tax rates were extremely high. And I don't think that some of their arguments have looked at the fact 
that you can take away a loophole and the reduction of rates that is proposed will make you getting a tax cut rather than a tax increase even with the loss of that loophole. I know that in my own state of California, the Tax Franchise Board, which is not exactly given to wanting to reduce revenues, they did a study and they said that the people of California, even with the non-deduction of state and local taxes, would be better off with this tax program at the new rates. Because those are pretty sizable reductions in rates. I don't know whether offhand I can remember one example of the figures accurately, so please caution or heed that caution on it. But there's something, there were some figures, a study recently that showed where just a few years ago only 3% of the taxpayers in this country were in a 28% marginal tax rate. And I think you'll find now that over 40% of the taxpayers are in a marginal 28% tax rate. Now this doesn't mean that more than 40% have now increased their revenues that much. They've increased the number of dollars, but in this inflationary age we've been through, the number of dollars does not reflect increased purchasing power. As a matter of fact, the average wage today is about uh, well, it's more than $100 above what it was in 1977. It was $189.77, it's $299 <clears throat> now, but the $299 in 1977 dollars is only worth $171. So the people have taken a cut. What about the deficit, Mr. President? You've backed the Graham-Rudman uh, idea, but some of your advisors are getting cold feet about it because they think it will lead to cuts in defense or a tax increase. Where do you stand on that now? Well, I'm concerned there as I am with, I think the same thing is happening now as they debate this, as is happening with the tax reform, that the original proposal of a five-year plan of continued decreases aimed at and succeeding in getting a balanced budget is now their method of arriving at these reductions is uh, being debated and discussed and proposals are being introduced that I think would make that good sound uh, policy of Graham Rudman's Hollings as um, unacceptable in the basis of what it would do. And one of the targets is defense. There are factions in there. The same group of people in the Congress that passed 033. Now I bought that. That resulted to get Zero, as you know, is no increase other than inflation for 86, and 3% increase and 3% increase for the next two years. That, to achieve that, brought about a sizable reduction of the defense budget. But we accepted that. Now, without even allowing it to go into effect, the same Congress is up there introducing amendments and so forth that would eliminate that and would further big, make big, dra big cuts in the defense spending and cuts that I don't believe we can afford. And certainly I wouldn't want to go to Geneva uh, with those cuts in my, in my hip pocket. So the House version of Graham Rudman is unacceptable to you? What they're talking about is unacceptable. And you've drawn the line in the sand. You're going to insist upon a 3% increase as you've agreed upon yes. the tax. And I agreed on that and I don't think that Congress who passed it and agreed to it should now uh, in a kind of a sneaky manner attempt to uh, throw it out. Can we ask you about the Supreme Court, sir, jumping to another issue? Uh, as you know, the, the Attorney General Meese has said that the Supreme Court has not been following the original intentions of the Founding Fathers and ruling on such issues as prayer and criminal rights. Some members of the Court, as you know, have spoken up publicly in disagreement, uh, saying that the law has evolved over time and must take into account other factors. Could you tell us your views on that? Yes, I think that, I think that over recent years, we have had courts that tended to legislate rather than interpret the Constitution. Now, the idea of prayer this is kind of strange in a body that it opens with prayer and that has over its, uh, its uh, uh, doorway of in God we trust. The, that amendment with regard to religious rights and not only prohibited a state religion, a state imposed religion, but it also prohibits the state from interfering with the practice of religion. And I don't believe the 
right of an individual. I am opposed to the idea of a formal prayer in school uh, and a, a dictated prayer by official or school authorities or anything else. But what I am in favor of is eliminating a decision or a rule that sends to all the generation of young people coming up through our schools, uh, uh, prayer is uh, unacceptable in certain public areas. The Congress of the United States opens with prayer. And uh, so I think that the Supreme Court went beyond uh, its, its uh, province there. I think at the same time, uh, with regard to some of the other things that the Attorney General is being criticized for, uh, I believed in affirmative action and civil rights before there were anything called affirmative action and civil rights. I was raised in a household in which the only way you could really get in trouble with your mother and father was if you showed any evidences of prejudice against anyone and were instituted by faculties in schools, or universities, hospitals had them to prevent them from having to accept uh, people of a certain religion, so forth, there. And I think that any place that we see now that affirmative action is being distorted to mean the re-implementation of quotas, that isn't what the Civil Rights Bill was all about. And anyone who wants to argue in that favor, just look at Hubert Humphrey's own words about it in which he said this was, civil rights was not put into effect to militate against anyone Intended to sign an executive order to that effect. Yes. Um, Mr. President, you're known as a, as a lucky man, almost a, yes, last question. Last question, almost a, a blessed one as a politician. And uh, during your presidency, you've survived an assassination attempt and come through a serious operation. Uh, we're very pleased to hear that you're back up to your best weight on the Nautilus. Um, but right now, you're on the verge of what could be a, a turning point in your tenure. Uh, and we wonder, if you ever wonder, late at night, um, where that luck comes from and will it hold? Well, <laughs> luck. Uh, sometimes I think you make your own, but uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've always thought that maybe uh, what some people are calling luck is just answers to prayers. Incidentally, I have to, I've got to take something back here. I realize I did something out of line when I said I would sign, when, no, when I would sign a, an executive order. I just it realized that this is the point at issue. And uh, I guess what was in my mind is that uh, I would be willing to support such a thing to ensure that there would not be quotas. But I don't think I have a right to say that I would sign what is at issue now until I have let everybody have their say at me. and, and uh, We'll there, reflect that. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I enjoy it. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Yes.